Okay, good morning in Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs. It's January 24th and uh, we have Ellen here. I think we can get through more than eight pages in the, in the next two hours. I'd really like to see if we can start getting Damien in the witness chair and let Ellen move on to other things for a little while. Um, but that would help us uh, get through the sections of our housing bill related to local zoning and Act 250, as I understand it. So, Ellen. Thank you. Good morning, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, we are looking at draft number 0091, draft 5.1, dated January 19th at 5.31 p.m. I started the walkthrough on Friday, and so we're picking up on page 12, section 9. So section 9, we're still talking about municipal zoning. Um, but this is a sort of new concept. It is a concept not currently in Vermont statute anywhere, um, but it is regarding permit decisions for municipal zoning. So uh, 24 VSA 4464B decisions, a decision rendered by the appropriate municipal panel for a housing development or the housing portion of a mixed use development shall not increase the minimum lot size required in the municipal bylaws onto page 13, increase the minimum parking requirements required in the municipal bylaws and in section 4414, which is the, the first section of this bill, reduce the building size to less than that allowed in the municipal bylaw, including reducing the building footprint or height, reduce the density of dwelling units allowed in the municipal bylaws, and otherwise disallow a development to abide by the minimum or maximum applicable municipal standards. Um, so I'll stop there quickly and then I'll read the next part. So this is talking about the appropriate municipal panel is either the DRB, the Development Review Board, or the Board of Adjustment, um, however the town has structured it. But it's when an applicant for a housing development or a mixed use development, which is a development that includes both um, commercial space and affordable housing uh, units uh, together in the same project. When they apply for a permit, the appropriate municipal panel who's issuing the permit cannot alter the minimums and maximums that have been set in the bylaws. And so what this means is that if the applicant has applied for the um, maximum number of units that is allowed under the statute, and based on what this bill has said, up to five units per acre, the municipality cannot in the permit decision reduce the number of permits, uh, reduce the number of units that they are allowed to build in that permit. So they can't use the permit decision to subvert what is established in the statute as well as in the bylaws. Um, and I think that this has been a common tool for municipalities. They sort of use it to um, make projects more palatable. They can, um, I mean, someone applies for a permit and then they can sort of adjust the size or dimensions of a project to address any concerns or mitigate any impacts. Um, but this is setting out that the default is they cannot do that, but there is an unless. So on page 13, line nine, however, a decision may require adjustments to the applicable municipal standards established in subdivision A if the panel or officer issues a written finding stating why the modification is necessary to comply with a prerequisite state or federal permit, a municipal permit, or a non-discretionary standard in a bylaw or ordinance, including requirements related to wetlands, setbacks, and flood hazard areas and river corridors, and how the identified restrictions do not result in an unequal treatment of housing or an unreasonable exclusion of housing development otherwise allowed by the bylaws. So if the town can demonstrate that um, they need to properly accommodate for wetlands or setbacks from other projects need to be complied with, um, if they can demonstrate that there's a state or federal permit maybe related to um, capacity, uh, 
wastewater capacity or something, if they can demonstrate that there's a, a limitation established by another set of permits that would directly impact the size of this project, they need to lay that out. And they also need to demonstrate in the written decision that there is no unequal treatment of housing or unreasonable exclusion of housing. So this is a pretty substantial change. Mm -hmm. um, it's titled by right, that, but it's not, it's conservative uh, framed as by right zoning, which is a different type of zoning that some other states have used. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's establishing that the municipality, once they've established their bylaws, um, setting these minimums and maximums, they can't change them indirectly through the issuing of permits. So, some of municipal statutes talk about providing open space, providing paths, recreational paths. Um, there's some land that is ledge or that might block your neighbor's view shed. Um, are those all excluded? And if it says you can have 16 houses an acre, it's 16 houses an acre and you can't require anything that might be based on the topography, such as granite ledge. Um, I mean, I'm, we, this is pretty extensive. So um, you listed a few different things that are disparate in my mind. I don't okay. think most of those things are actually addressed in these statutes. Like there isn't a statutory requirement that there be you should. a view shed. Um, there are, it gets complicated because character of the area is actually an entirely different subject, not here. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I know someone who ended up in court, I believe had to remove because they built higher than they, they blocked the neighbor's view of the gold dome. Right. Um, I've written sales contracts with view uh, protection abatements in them, which limits the height that the neighbor can build on his vacant lot. Um, this, I'm trying to figure out what problem we're trying to solve, and it's maybe because I'm new, but. I mean, I see this as trying to set a standard and not move the goalposts because you don't want a particular type of housing or you don't all of a sudden, you know, there's a new argument that's, that's being made that wasn't, you know, that creates inconsistency where someone comes thinking, I'm looking at what's here and what's allowed. And now I'm being told the new neighbor doesn't, doesn't like it. I mean, I think, I don't know, you know, we, I don't know that we can get into everybody's sort of detailed circumstances of covenants and areas where you said, I you can't don't have build anything but colonial architecture in mm -hmm. my street. I don't know when a brick ranch house became colonial architecture, but that's what right. it says. But everyone knows that, so no one's like coming with a modern build. We've so put a few new ranch houses on the street. <laughs> but also, correct me if I'm wrong, this only applies to the downtown and village center, or does this apply town wide? Town wide. Anywhere where there's bylaws. Yeah. Okay. Um, and at, when. Because this subject came up last year in testament about the covenants of green space, as we talked about density, that we wouldn't want to get rid of the, the parks and green spaces mm -hmm. that have been protected by covenants. I don't, and I don't think anything we would do would change that. Right. So that is not addressing that. Right. But that was one of her questions. Right. So that's not part of this. Um, it is requiring that if a municipality is going to change. So it, the municipality has established in their bylaws minimums and maximums, like the parking maximum of one per dwelling unit, um, and a half. Uh, or the five units per acre. They cannot, in the decision, uh, reduce the number um, without laying out why it is necessary for them to do that and how they're not having an unequal treatment of housing. Mm -hmm. 
So, so I know I had assumed and clearly wrongly that this that these proposals were to apply to our downtown and village centers, not to the whole town. Because what we're trying to do is promote greater density in our downtown and village centers. So by right, this proposal by right applies to the whole town. Yes. The whole, the whole town where they have their bylaws have already set forth certain mins and maxes. But the challenge here is um, uh, if we're trying to protect, towns have a lot of undeveloped space. Um, I don't see the undeveloped space. I don't want to see undeveloped space. I mean, part of the whole point of this is to focus our attention for development downtown village centers. I don't want to see the same density out where it's now undeveloped. It's, so there's nothing here that would, it's only where, but I mean, this you know. is where they've set minimum and maximum requirements already for development and housing. So it's where they said, and do those relate? Do those correlate with downtown and village center designations? Not no. everyone has them. No, not necessarily, but um, not this is has. not establishing yeah. any kind of uh, this. This in itself isn't establishing um, minimums and maximums for undeveloped um, or what would be probably zoned as like rural low density. Mm -hmm. um, it is requiring the municipality to, to the municipalities permit to uphold what they have established in their bylaws and so if they have zoned you know rural ag district differently then this has to the permits issued under that need to comply based on that standard this is not intended to increase density in places where the town has not already established okay. that but just to maintain that they are using the bylaw as they have set it out uh, and not applying and not, something through an individual permit that would change that yes okay but let me let some oh this is the direct earlier didn't we say that they could not um, have dense we put some restrictions on it said they had to allow eighth of an acre zoning so an eighth of an acre zoning is not in this it's not it's in not this. in this bill um, where there is, is what is in this bill is a requirement that municipalities allow up to five units per acre. So fifth of an acre. So they could zone they, but it municipal. is not mandating minimum lot sizes. So they could do it by allowing one fifth of an acre lot sizes, or they could do it by allowing duplexes on. Um, Two point, how many? <laughs> Whatever of an eight, three on <laughs> half an acre, two on another. Yeah, like a duplex. So um, it is not mandating how they actually achieve five units per acre, but that their zoning doesn't impede five units per acre, and that's in a different place than when this is saying. And, right. right. Yeah. I yeah. think it's not in this by right section, no. and that does apply to downtown village centers, the five. Oh. Yes, well, it's municipal water and sewer, which we can revisit, but it's if you, it's fun. That's well, quadruplexes. Right. I think, you I know, once we, once yeah. we, it would be great, great to have a chart for each yeah. section and yeah. what it allows and what it doesn't allow so we can be clear on, on because I want to be clear on what we're green lighting in downtown New right. Delhi centers sure. and what is we're making possible yeah. for the whole town. And again, we're, we're looking at it now and we're hearing a lot about which Perfect. designation should apply to what. So we'll let, I'll let it walk through it and then we can let her go back this so week and help us summarize what we're, what the decisions are. So right, and I think that this by right provision is intended to be achieving the same goal in a different way as the prior section in saying, okay, we are requiring that towns allow through their bylaws five units per acre, they cannot then get around that requirement by then only issuing permits for three units per acre. That is sort of the intent of the section because the prior sections only, only um, specify that the bylaws have to dictate something. But the towns also have control over the permits they issue and how they condition those permits. So this is another means at getting at that same goal. 
We're not letting them move the goalposts somewhere else on whatever we decide should take place in the first section. So every town has to allow five acre, five units per acre somewhere. In their areas that are served by municipal water and sewer. Water and sewer. Yeah, that's the ticket. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what if the topography doesn't work? I mean, some that'll make it more expensive and people may not want to do it. And also right. they'll need to justify I'm, that but in the legislation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you could say, okay, this property doesn't work for the whole acre, but they were going to put one house here and we're asking them to consider putting a triplex instead. You know, you wouldn't have to do five single family homes plotted around the acre. Senator Harrison, and it's a I, discussion. I'd like yeah. you all to go with me to my local planning commission that's already having me in. I just want to right. to some neighbors this weekend. <laughs> You're welcome to borrow my PowerPoint if you try. <laughs> Senator Harrison. Thank you. Um, so uh, when I read this at first, I thought that it meant that the action of making a decision wouldn't then be taken as a way of changing the bylaws themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think the intent is that the towns abide by the bylaws, is what I'm hearing. I think both things are true, right? Oh, interesting. Because you, you're not changing a bylaw through the issuance of a permit. The bylaw is what is supposed to guide the issuance right. of the permit. So you can't use that to change what's already been set. Right. And but then. But if you read this literally, mm -hmm. I think it does say that. But yeah. maybe we can have a chat another mm -hmm. time. Is there, do you want to circle something where it, well, feel like it's a well, just for example, like, um, you know, shall not increase the minimum lot size required in the municipal bylaws. I would suggest that we say shall not require a larger lot size than that required in the municipal bylaws so that it can't be contrary to the bylaws. I, I think that's what the intent is. Yeah, permits can't change bylaws. Well, that's what I thought yeah, initially I thought they meant, but but it doesn't make sense that a permit would change the bylaws. Right. Although maybe there's something in case law where you say, oh, you no. did it seven times, so then it's... You know. No, and uh, I'm happy to um, work on this language. Mm -hmm. It is a tricky thing to draft because municipalities structure it so differently. Mm -hmm. And so if a um, developer or someone who's applying for a permit isn't actually applying for the maximum, this is not imposing the maximum but um, it's prohibiting the town from um, making undue adjustments to the application without justifying why that would be necessary. Right. And, and that makes sense. But and maybe we can talk about that. No, I, I get it. Like, okay. you know, I think working on wording changes that you feel make a difference is something that we often do do out, okay. offline, but it's helpful to know like an example of what you're, yeah. you're thinking of. Yeah, this is just was that enough block. of an example? That was a good example. Okay. Yeah, like yes. just, yeah, you have a okay. great local break, okay. a local government break. So, you know, if you think there's there's ways to make sure it's clear that we're not yeah. departing from the file. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll circle that. Yeah, yeah and the others too, but <laughs> right, we can right. talk about those. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so the next section, um, section 11, is an appropriation. So on page 14, the sum of $500,000 is appropriated from the general fund to the municipal and regional planning fund for the purpose of assisting municipalities in updating their bylaws to reflect the changes made in this act. Um, so the municipal and regional planning fund already exists. Uh, we talked about it a little bit last year in this committee. Um, the Department of Housing and Community Development administers it. It is currently primarily funded by um, part of the property transfer tax. And so there's a formula in statute. So some of the money goes to the regional planning commissions and some of the money um, goes to the municipal pot and municipalities um, apply for grants to use the funding there to make um, changes either to their town plan or whatever stage they're at in their um, municipal zone planning and zoning, um, they can apply to use these funds to do that work. And so this is a, 
providing additional increase since towns will need to update their bylaws. Senator, a question. Um, often it can take two years to update bylaws. Um, is there a deadline to update and or would we consider some sort of expedited process? So I will say that the effective date on the sections we have reviewed is pushed out until December 1, 2024 to accommodate the time needed for these changes. Um, so you can consider that is enough. Um, the other thing I would say is that in absence of updated bylaws, the statute controls. So, um, okay, yeah. And I'm just, I mean, we've, um, Wendy, we've had money in for the last two years on bylaw modernization. Two or three years. I, anyway, two or two, last two years. And we've had a big uptake on it. And I think all the money may have been used. Anyway, I can't remember how, I know it was robustly used and towns applied for it and have been using it. Uh, I just don't know. I can't remember if we had an update on how much money was left in that fund. And if this, because this is roughly what we had put, what we put more aside initially. So I think the first year was 500,000 and the second year was 600. And it was a little more. Thousand, it was, it was, because yeah. it was so well used. Yeah. So I'd love to, okay, just a marker on this just to get an update mm -hmm. on how well used the mm -hmm. bylaw modernization because this goes hand in glove with that work. Right. And, and I think Chris started to talk about that. Yeah. He did. And just something to consider if I would suggest that the, the process of the bylaw um, updates for municipalities is um, very long and includes a lot of um, public outreach as it should. Um, but if a town is just complying with something that the state is imposing, the public's not really going to be able to, you know, public input is right. just going to be explanatory. They won't mm -hmm. have an impact. It'll, it'll be public right? outrage, I'm sure. <laughs> right, right. So it might be easier and better to just have a quicker program. Or, or, or process yeah. mm. in those situations. We're basically mm -hmm. telling towns how they have to serve. Yes, this is, we're going to hear from right. you. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. I'm just yeah. putting in our head that maybe a, a quicker, cheaper process mm. okay. might might be better in situations like this when there's really no choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is something that you should consider about what you want the effective date to actually be. Um, I would only just add that because one of the sort of mechanisms you're using in this bill is um, in areas served by sewer and water infrastructure, you do want to make sure that the towns that have those systems have them mapped so that it is a... I know, that's another question. Yeah. I, mean, I, I have a lot so of questions. So that they know the yeah. a lot more people to yeah. build their water and sewer to meet this kind of growth. And, and I'm sure we're not the only city that had that happen. And if I come up against a high density subsidized housing project and a new major employer, and I have limited water and sewer capacity, who dictates where that decision gets made? And that's, we turned down Ben and Jerry's because they would have eaten up our sewer capacity. Um, so I think we'll hear, I mean, I think we'll hear and, and we'll want to have a philosophical discussion about using municipal water and sewer capacity as a guidepost for development because it will create the limit development. Exactly. Um, right. And, you know, I think that's just a, a big question. We'll have to ask, or do we want to incentivize growth in certain areas and say, you know, you're only eligible for certain funds if you designate this as a, you know, a, a neighborhood development area and benefits flow from that. So I think that's a big, I totally get it. It's a big question on the table about what if this means towns don't do municipal sewer and water just to avoid, you know, having to fall under this. Well, well. it's a very expensive process right. to do yeah. municipal sewer and water. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, if sure I like is. the status quo, I wouldn't put it in. Right. 
Well, it's a, yeah, uh, there's a, I have yeah. a lot of questions on that. Yeah. Yeah. Just because we don't define service areas mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. And that might be something that we want to do. Right. Water and sewer service areas and then water or sewer. And then what about private sewer mm -hmm. or private water? We have Does a great, count? Have a great form, committee for this private water. <laughs> I think there's you more. We have to two in Vernon. Some associations. Yeah. So, yeah. You pay a ready to serve fee and the city pumps your septic system once a year. So there's, we, so there's just a lot of variations. So, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Ellen can't, can't solve this problem community. for us. So, so like, let's let right. Ellen continue. <laughs> okay, so um, leaving the municipal zoning realm. Um, so on page 14, section 11A is a different topic, though related. Um, so housing resource navigator for regional planning commissions. The Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies, which is the umbrella agency for the regional planning commissions, shall hire housing resource navigators, which shall serve underserved communities by working with municipalities, local housing organizations, and private developers to identify housing opportunities, match communities with funding resources, and provide project management support. There is appropriated the sum of $300,000 in fiscal year 2024 to VAPTA for the purpose of hiring the housing navigators as described. So this, I drafted this language um, uh, and I think that this is a really, I think this is a trickier issue than it may initially seem. VAPTA does, and you should hear from them. Mm -hmm. I don't think VAPTA currently has employees like the way that this is envisioned. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Individual RP mm -hmm. seems to, but not right. VAPTA. And they are not, the RPC employees are not state employees. So I couldn't like create a position in statute. So you may just want to hear, you should hear from VAPTA on how they would handle this. Um, and if this is the proper way to actually structure this. Um, and, and the amount, because and the amount, at, which that's, is very low. Yeah, for, I was going to say that's three employees. Yeah, I think you that's your salary and your benefits. This is and not much. No, I just asked Mitch to make sure Scott ha puts it on the witness list. I think I got confused about the Planners Association. Yes, so this oh, is planners different. Yes, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> the planners, the planners are a different association. Right. But this is the umbrella agency, for and neither could really do this. Right. Have to figure out. No, the RPCs can do it. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, anyway, the amount is very low, and the uh, yeah. And this is a new program, so it would be on both parts. Yeah. So that's another goes hand in glove with the index idea. I mean, oh, with the helping our rural communities. Mm -hmm. So this is the technical assistance yeah. on which we can have more. Right, right. We do we do like technical assistance, but maybe and that's what a bigger pot of money is out there. Yeah. But this kind of goes hand in glove with that. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you, Alan. All right. So <laughs> section 12 starts the Act 250 amendments. No big deal. <laughs> All right, so at the bottom of page 14, on to page 15, the definition of development means each of the following. So as you will recall from your Act 50 um, discussions in the past, the definition of development is what sets the jurisdictional triggers for which projects require an Act 50 permit. Currently, under the statute, there is a concept called the priority housing projects, and we'll look at the definition fully on the next page. Um, but uh, currently, 10 or more units of housing that is constructed trigger Act 250. Um, also, we have the one acre and 10 acre towns. And so uh, in a 10 acre town, 10 or more acres um, trigger Act 250 or one or more acres of commercial development trigger Act 250. Um, and so starting there, there are two changes that are happening on page 15. So first, development means the construction of housing projects, such as cooperatives, condos, or dwellings, or construction or maintenance of mobile homes or mobile home parks with 20 or more units constructed or maintained on a tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person within a radius of five miles of any point on any involved land within a continuous period of five years. 
So as I just mentioned, currently under the statute, 10 units of housing constructed triggers Act 250. And so this is increasing that to 20. Next, currently in statute, um, all the language that struck starting on line six, um, that language establishes a cap on the number of priority housing projects um, within a project that are exempt. And so what that means is that priority housing projects are exempt from Act 250 if they meet the number of housing units within, based on the size of the town. And so currently, um, 75 or more units in a municipality with a population between 6,000 and 10,000. Once you hit 75, you trigger Act 250. So you can build 74 units and be exempt. We All changed this last year. Yes. So if you look on line 15, last year you removed the smallest cap. So towns with up to, from zero to 6,000 population can build up to 49 units. At 50, they become, they trigger Act 50 again. And so this is removing all of the caps and just saying any construction of priority housing projects is exempt. And that, and that is for the designation, designated areas. Yes. Which is what we're talking about, that caps and corp, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, there's more details on that on the next page. And so further down on line 19 as well, currently it says, um, the word development does not include the construction of priority housing projects in a municipality with a population of 10,000 or more. So now it just says development does not include the construction of a priority housing project. And, you know, this is what the governor was talking about in his address about Middlebury and, uh, and the housing project that in a much lower cap than they otherwise wanted to be able to. So, yeah, Senator Carson. So we don't use the word priority housing between lines one and six. But my understanding is if it's a priority housing project, it's exempt, period, no matter what it says. Oh, it's at the bottom now. It says that now at the bottom. Yes, so you're right. There are two concepts happening right. on this page. They're the first is general housing, 20 units or more will trigger Act 250. And at the bottom now it says, the construction of, prior, of any priority housing projects are that's it that is exempt and it's priority it's that it's defined later it's on defined. so do you want to talk about that now the, the definition is on the next page so on page 16 we can jump down to line 13 and this is the definition of a, of a priority housing project so it is a discrete project located on a single track or multiple contiguous tracts of land that consists exclusively of mixed income housing or mixed use or any combination thereof and is located entirely within a designated downtown, designated new town center, a designated village center that has permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, designated growth center or designated neighborhood development area. Um, so this means it's a mixed use housing project or a mixed income housing project in a designated center. And those two phrases are defined in Act 250. So a mixed use project I've already mentioned is a uh, mix of commercial and residential with affordable, with a emphasis on affordable because it uses the definition of mixed income housing. So mixed income, I, I know that this is gonna sound confusing and the NRB has a really great flow chart to explain this so we, can, coming in. so we can give you that so that it's a little more clear than how I'm explaining it. But mixed income housing is, um, it can be either owner occupied or rental, but at least 20% of the housing units are affordable for at least 15 years. This was the challenge that you'll recall Senate Natural Resources. And affordable. Debated last year. Um, there, so affordable is also defined for both rental and uh, owner occupied housing and it uh, does not exceed 30% of the gross annual income of a household at 80% of the highest of county median income, um, area median income or statewide median income. And so, uh, so under this 
not every unit needs to be affordable. Only 20% of the units need to be affordable for 15 years. And affordable is defined as 30% of income, either area median income, state median income, or county median income. Whichever is less, probably, right? Uh, I think it says the greatest, but uh, I think that potentially oh. VHFA works on this. So I, I am not an expert on how that actually works. So you can hear more about how that works in practice. Senator Harris, just a quick, is there a mixed use that's just commercial and residential together? Because that's what other places in the country call mixed use. Or does that so, not exist? In, in, so, in, in, so, right, well, but, but, but without the affordability component. Oh, no. Okay. No. Okay. There is an affordability requirement. Okay. But only for 15 years. Uh, I understand. Yeah. And I go, yeah. I'm just wondering. As we sort of dive right into the heart of the Act 250 section, I'm just going to say for anyone listening, we're trying to focus any Act 250 changes specifically on housing right. in designated growth areas. We're getting outreach about can you solve all of our, our whole problems in Act 250? And this will, we will only be considering issues pertaining to housing. Yeah, that's really good to say. And I would say that mixed use is relevant because it yes. makes housing um, better it, and, it, yeah. and more, more desirable. And it makes downtowns and, and the transportation yes. limits. So it, that touches housing, but yes. The Wilson know. Block in Springfield's a classic example of this. We went and toured it, and uh, you know, it's mixed use of commercial first floor and affordable units upstairs. And I think all uh, some of them are market rate, some of them are affordable. The entire Barry Street, the condos and the um, rental units are mixed. Yeah. And these are mostly market. priority projects. Yeah. So uh, yeah. And yeah, it's it's great. The I would love to uh, I don't know who keeps the data on this, but I would love to see what happens to the priority projects after 15 years. How many actually go straight up to market rate? How many stay affordable? You know, how, I'd love to the see The HFA is our starting place for data. They might be. That's right. They the H and we'll ask Leslie that question because yeah. that's I'm, I hope they track long term where, what happens to it because I think that was the concern that Senate Natural debated quite a bit last year, right? right? Is that that whole issue of well, why are we putting public money into something that's eventually not going to be affordable anymore? Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to hear, you know, could we do more to incentivize uh, housing in within? Uh, at 250, that's you know, net zero energy, fossil, fossil fuel free. I mean, we might be able to look at even further at you know other ways to incentivize getting rid of duplication from different state agencies and Act 250 with fossil fuel changes. Yeah. So the one caveat I'd say is yes, this bill deals exclusively with Act 250 issues in housing. But I think we fool ourselves in thinking that Act 250 changes can be done in a vacuum just dealing with this one thing. Because mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest challenges we have faced is that we, uh, and that we faced for the last three years on this bill and on these changes, has been uh, what we get to further protect. And what we do to green light. Mm -hmm. And I think those are challenging balancing, challenges to balance. And I think you can't do just this. I mean, we're doing just this, but someone else is going to have to do mm -hmm. something else. Scary. The housing committee should try to do housing. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and we have been trying yeah. for several <laughs> years, but it's always we hit that challenge. Yeah. Is that fair? Oh gosh, <laughs> I don't know. That's I not an Ellen question. <laughs> that's, a us, getting... that's an us well, question. So um, on page 16, there are two other changes here in the definition of development. Um, and 
I drafted them separately from the priority housing language, so we may need to check if they layer correctly. But so at the top of page 16, line one, notwithstanding subdivision four of this subdivision, the construction of improvements in a designated neighborhood development area for a housing project or mixed use development with 10 or more units constructed or maintained on a tract of tract or tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person is development because the lead in language there is development includes the following so this is creating a specific jurisdictional trigger for designated development area of uh, neighborhood development areas for the construction of 10 or more units so this is and it's removing the five year five mile rule so you may have heard when I read on page 15 that the general language currently for housing projects is 10 or more units on one or more tract owned or controlled by a person constructed within five years and within five miles of each other. That triggers Act 250. So this is saying in a netting for a development area, 10 units of housing triggers Act 250, but it does not include the restriction of within five years or five miles. Thank you. Very clear explanation. So it doesn't include the five mile or the five yeah. years. So, um, I drafted this so we can. I'm I'm just gonna take ownership of this, but it may not layer properly with the changes you're making to the priority housing exemption. Mm -hmm. And I just, just we need to maybe think okay. through that because of the phrase mixed use there is, mm -hmm. is sort of what I'm thinking. So technically, as we just discussed with our Senator Harrison, um, mixed use as defined in Act 250 includes affordable housing, and so. It's, there's a possibility that someone could build a mixed use development that wouldn't be a priority housing project, but it's extremely unlikely because if they're building the mixed use, they're probably hitting the priority housing project mm -hmm. exemption. So at least that aspect of this, you may just want to consider if that's okay. redundant because it is in the develop, uh, neighborhood development area. Okay. So that's just a flag. Okay. Um, because other, and so again, and you're talking specifically about housing projects here on line three also. Um, and so that would cover market rate housing projects, mm -hmm. non affordable housing projects. But with the definition of mixed use, those are going to be have some uh, component of affordability. Okay. Like that. But as it's written, it includes market and affordable. Um, so the definition because housing of project is just commercial the housing project could be yes housing project yes high end it's probably high end or market yes. rate okay um, but mixed use as defined in the statute includes affordability okay um, and so then uh, nearly identical language again starting with line seven under the definition of subdivision. So the other way you trigger Active 50 is if you are um, subdividing land. And so like with um, commercial, it's 10 lots being subdivided in a 10 acre town triggers Act 250 or six lots in a town without permanent zoning and subdivision uh, rules triggers Act 250. So this is creating again another um, separate provision that says subdivision means each of the following a tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person that the person has partitioned or divided for the purpose of resale into 10 or more lots located within a designated neighborhood development area. So it's again removing the five year five mile rule. Okay. Um, the next section on page 17 is a um, small change again related to priority housing projects. So it's 10 BSA 6081P. 
Um, and so this is striking again the other reference to the caps on priority housing projects. So no permit or permit amendment is required for a priority housing project in a designated area in a designated center. And so it's striking the reference to the jurisdictional thresholds, which is what we've called the caps. Yeah. Okay. So that is the Act 250 language. And so next is an entirely different subject. <laughs> well, it goes back part to what we we're talking about earlier, which are covenants. Covenants. Right. Yes. Which we have addressed in prior years also. Yes. So section 13 on page 17. Um, is amending 27 VSA 545, and 545 is the section that this committee had added um, in previous years, yes. and so that is staying intact. So the existing language on line eight is that deed restrictions, covenants, or similar binding agreements added after March 1st, 2021, that prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting land development allowed under 4412-1E, which is accessory dwelling units, and 2A, which are the existing small lots, shall not be valid. So the existing law is that these covenants cannot, new covenants cannot be added that would prohibit accessory dwelling units or small, or the development of a small lot. Those provisions are invalid. So new language is added on line 11. So deed restrictions or covenants added after July 1, 2023 shall not be valid if they require a minimum dwelling unit size on the property or more than one parking space per dwelling unit. So this is again, you've, you're in the earlier sections, you're getting at these issues by dictating what the municipality can, can or can't do. And this is saying private parties in their deed restrictions can't subvert those um, re statutory requirements by putting something in the deed that would uh, require minimum building size or um, parking space minimums. That parking base minimum is going to be an issue if you're talking. Most people have two cars. They, one works in Burlington and one works in White River. And the cars are going to get parked somewhere. And where is that going to be? So it still is allowing, it, it's the developers still have the ability to construct these parking spaces, but the town can't require them and the a provision can't be added in the deed restriction that requires. Them. Okay, but if you don't have to add more than what it's, that's money. It's money that's gonna go in the developer's pocket and let, especially if you're talking affordable units, not high end, high end, he can, Put two or three. It's an amenity, I, I, but the I just, town is going to be yeah. left to deal with the parking. The, I, we hear that this is a concern, and I think that we'll have witnesses where this this debate can be had. I just I think Alex reached her capacity of you know how she can respond. <laughs> yeah, no, I just yeah but that flat. one. This is a municipal flag, <laughs> yes. unlike, of course, the other section. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. What proportion of this of the housing in the state is covered by covenants? I mean, just Each just roughly different covenants. Different right. projects have different covenants. Well, many of them don't have any at all. Correct. I mean, the older right. places. Right. right. I mean, but um, like HOAs aren't. Very common here was my understanding. But a maybe lot that's of condos have no laundry, no bird feeders, no uh, oh. political signs, mm -hmm. no real estate signs. Well, we removed language that said no black people, no Jewish oh, people. Oh my, we I mean that okay. Is, well, yeah. we yeah. removed a bunch of so, coming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Jen, I can see Jen Holler right there right, in this right. chair. So we this. have, you know, and. I think it was a surprise to everyone, but yeah. if you look at historical records, some of these covenants were never removed. Right. So I don't know that we have right. to. Yeah, there's still. I, I was just wondering yeah. about how many. It's a good question. Yeah. How many. All right. My so we'll, I don't know if we have like, a covenant expert. For <laughs> HOAs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. they're there. They haven't been enforced. I'm they're illegal, oh, okay. but That's they're still sitting somewhere in on your deed. But 
it's come up several times. It is very expensive process to alter a deed. Oh, right. So the this deed is it's on the deed and the deed passes. It's illegal. It hasn't been enforced in a hundred years, but it still sits there. And people are very upset that it's, I'm sure it still says, I can only build colonial architecture and I don't know what else. I'm not. All right, I, I misunderstood. I thought these would be only um, covenants with HOAs, but but these are mm -hmm. individual deeds. So someone could these are, yes. put on their individual deed mm -hmm. and it carried down a hundred years. It's like the yeah. view shed restrictions. Okay. Got and, it. Yeah. Thank and, you. And, the, and used a lot in downtown commercial development in terms of setbacks and uh, open space and um, yes. and art. Wow. Um, another way that it comes up in the smaller developments is if a person has a large property and they want to sell off one single lot to someone to just raise some money and they put a lot of deed restrictions right. on the property um, in an attempt to sort of mitigate any impact their neighbors may have on them. Okay. Um, but that ha we have seen the prior, actually the, the language that was passed by this committee that's on line eight, um, there was a court case on a, a property that had intentionally said that the subdivided property couldn't have an ADU. Um, and so while that had been established in statute as allowing ADUs, the deed restriction had limited. Interesting. Dis okay. Disallowed. Okay. Interesting. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And I will just say that um, this section, as with the already existing language, is prospective. So mm -hmm. it's not going to invalidate existing right. deeds. It's prospective. These covenants cannot be added. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so page 18 uh, is um, sort of now we're in like grab bag topics. <laughs> um, so section eight or page 18, section 14 is an interesting topic. Road disclosure. Um, so new language added to title 27. Disclosure of maintenance on class four highway. Any property owner who sells property located on a class four highway or legal trail shall disclose to the buyer that the municipality is not required to maintain the highway or trail as described in um, 19 BSA section 310. Non-compliance with the requirements of the section shall not affect the marketability of the title of a property. And any realtor that now values their license will disclose that. And any other rights of way. Yeah. I mean, there are other rights of way other than plus four roads. So it could be for sale by owner, you know, in some situations. Where... So um, this is not making any change to that type of thing, just requiring property owners to disclose that the property is on a class four highway. And by definition, class four highways are those that are not maintained. And so that includes paving and plowing. Mm -hmm. Plowing is the big one. Plowing is the big one, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so does this include other rights of way that might be in a deed or in a or those articulated already in the deed? So like a like a utility right away or, or what kind of right away? A neighbor right away. Uh, like a native and they, you know, let's say you have a landlocked piece that you have a, 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 a completely yeah. surrounded piece of property. So there are often rights of ways for that. driveways and other ways of accessing a property. Uh, uh, piece of land. Yeah, there I yeah. sold they, one. Yeah. It was on a class four road. There was a driveway. There was a house, but there was a right of way to a seasonal mobile home in the woods. And I believe that's all in the deed. And this was right. within two miles of this building. I mean, it's not... Right, but out there. is that already covered the rights of way in, in other places? So I am not a real estate expert. <laughs> right. um, uh, I would I mean, just say just this, one type. this is specific. Largely, a right of way is established through the deed. Um, and so right. if it isn't, there usually is a court case to establish the right of way. <laughs> right. Um, and so this is not about that. And I don't know what the other requirements related to those things are specifically. Um, I am not 
the real estate attorney. Yeah, se septic easements. Yes. Septic, sorry, I'm not <laughs> septic. Highly regulated, but thank good what she said. <laughs> I have enough on my platter. I am an expert in municipal sludge. Well, great, we're about to talk about it. Okay, <laughs> great segue. <laughs> Um, and so finally, the sludge um, is language that your committee has reviewed multiple times. It has. Um, and there is only one small change to it that I will highlight. So on page 18, there are a pair of sections, section 15 and 16. And this is what has been called um, reducing the, the duplicative permits. I'm not sure everyone would characterize it that way, but currently under statute, and just a reminder, I am not the wastewater attorney. And so if you want a detailed explanation of how these things work, I can get you an attorney or you can hear from a and um, But currently under statute, connecting to the wastewater system requires a permit full from the Department of Environmental Conservation, the state agency, as well as the municipality. Um, and so this, is laying out an exemption from the state permit if the municipality does certain things. So section six, uh, section 15 on page 18 says, the following projects are exempt, following projects and actions are exempt, for, and that's from the state permit. A project completed by a person who receives an authorization from a municipality that administers a program registered with the secretary pursuant to section 1983 of this title. And so 1983 is section 16. The language is on page 19. And that reads, a municipality may issue an authorization for a connection or an existing connection with a change in use to the municipal sanitary sewer connection line via a sanitary sewer service line or a connection to a water main via a new water server service line in lieu of permits issued under this chapter, provided that the municipality documents the following in a form prescribed by the secretary. The municipality owns or has legal control over connections to a public community water system permitted pursuant to chapter 56 of this title and over connections to a wastewater treatment facility permitted pursuant to chapter 47 of this title. The municipality shall only issue authorizations for a sanitary sewer service line that connects to a sanitary sewer collection line and a water sewer a water service line that connects to a water main. The building or structure authorized under this section connects to both the sanitary sewer collection line and the public community water system. The authorizations from the municipality comply with the technical standards for sanitary sewer service lines and water server water service lines in the wastewater system and potable water supply rules. The municipality requires documentation issued by a professional engineer or licensed designer that is filed in the land records that the connection authorized by the municipality was installed in accordance with the technical standards. The municipality requires the authorization to be filed in the land records. So that's the only new provision to this is filing it in the land records. And the municipality requires the retention of plans that show the, uh, the location and design of the authorized connections. The, the municipality shall notify the secretary 30 days in advance of terminating any authorization. The municipality shall provide all authorizations and plans to the secretary as part of this termination notice. A municipality issuing an authorization under this section shall require the person to whom the authorization is issued to post notice of the authorization as part of the notice required for a permit issued under 4449 of Title 24 or other bylaw authorized under this chapter. Okay, so there's a lot there, <laughs> um, but basically in order for a town, in order for projects, to be exempt from the state project uh, permit. The town has to meet all these requirements and demonstrate to the state that it has done all these things. Um, a lot of them just require sort of a, the documentation that the standards are being met. 
And when you said this one piece is new, Senator Harrison, that just means we've looked at this language in committee at least twice yeah. before. For several years. I have been trying to do away with the duplicative permits along with Jeff Wenberg, former mayor of Rutland, mm. for over a quarter of a century. Um, Mostly, everything goes through the municipality. It's the municipality's water and sewer. It just is a double fee. The state doesn't come out and do anything. You just charge a developer. And this says you only get exempt from paying that if you're on both water and sewer. Mm -hmm. There are a lot mm -hmm. of places that are on municipal water or municipal sewer, but their lot provides plenty of space for septic or for a well. And this would mean I'd have to pay a double fee to hook up to the city sewer unless I was also hooking up to the city water. So you're thinking of maybe an or instead of an and. Yeah. Yeah, that, I have a bunch of questions, but yeah. I, I, I can um, go through them pretty quickly. And I agree. I was wondering why it's and. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously what you looked at previously didn't get passed. That's right. Sorry. Okay. That well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your effort. But this is, this, <laughs> yeah. but maybe this is the year. Yes, um, no, this makes so much sense to me. It makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah. This is still when the state was sure that the towns were going to put Levittown all over the place. There's and just yeah, yeah. and yeah, I, I totally it's, agree. it's the nanny state. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah. just a couple questions mm -hmm. on yeah. how this would work. It's also efficient. Do right. <laughs> no, there's a lot of reasons to do this, and right. but I won't. I wasn't going to go into those. I was just <laughs> going to go into the process. Yeah. Um, do towns need prior authorization from the state? It, it looks as if they do not. For what? To to be able to do this. Yes, they do. Okay. Is that said somewhere else? It's so it's the first. So it's in combination with the prior section. So the municipality administers a program that is registered with the state. With the okay. Secretary, okay. And so then subdivision A lays out that they can do this if they um, uh, document the following items. Provide and provide that to the secretary of A and R. Perfect. So they're registered with the state as an authorized town to do this. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah, everybody. Um, so yeah. I would just a couple of picky things. I, I would just say municipality may issue an authorization for a new connection or an existing connection with a change in use. Um, is something I would look at or a connection or change to a water main via a new water service line. Um, and if we have different service areas, yeah, that's what I was thinking too, is, is can a municipality, say a municipality only has water and not sewer, can, can they be part of this program? Um, I don't know. Okay. I, I would, I would hope that they could. And there are private water systems. Like right. Wood, well, those those Woodstock, they're only I believe there aren't that many towns that have private town. No, it's not private. It's a privately owned business right. that provides right. water to most of East Montpelier. Yeah. So Woodstock also has a private water system, which right. we're hoping will that will change in the future. But there are several t towns that depend on private water systems. Right, and it's not. A fire district. I mean, right. Part of, well, we just bought it out, but part of Montpelier was a fire district right. because the private water system came in, literally, the well came in. So, uh, okay. So I mean, there, there's just this huge right, a lot of variability. Bag. Yeah. I think it's okay to limit this to municipalities at first, just to make it mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, it needs to happen. Okay, so, so my, oh, oh, sorry, did you have Yeah, just a couple, yeah. um, and then an or instead of an and is what I would yeah. suggest also, but that's a- What line is that? Right? Um, on line 11, just that the municipality owns or has legal control over connections or over connections to a wastewater treatment facility, but perhaps some other 
the committee wanted it to be and. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, we can start with a discussion. Would like, yeah. And then that's kind of the same comment on number three. And then um, sometimes you want to require pre-treatment as a as a owner of a, um, a septic or a um, wastewater facility. So I would just want to put that in. Um, that mm -hmm. that the municipality is authorized to require pre-treatment, but that may be in the um, uh, registration. I think let's pause. Sure. I don't, yeah. Maybe. Oh, is I that too much? So I'm what sorry. I'm, what okay. I'm hearing is that maybe some people want to workshop this section with Michael Brady. The, yeah, or, or I can even do it offline. If, well, online yeah, that's would be with the line. ledge well, council. Well, okay, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay, part yeah. of it is that some of you have been working on this for years. Some of this comes from the municipal background. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? yeah, I've been working on the other side of it for years. Right. In the first half of this, we're assuming that towns try and stop housing, or at least lower income housing, or dense housing. And so we're stopping them. And yet here, where they could stop housing by not having enough water sewer capacity, we're assuming that they're just willy nilly passing it out. And I think what I'm missing is probably what you've heard in the past is to, is, is zoning why we, I mean, is this a, a, a perverse thing or is it just a few wealthy towns? Is this a perverse thing where towns are discriminating in housing or, you know, why aren't we building housing? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not clear. I've got a lot of answers, but I'm not, I haven't heard the testimony that tells me what the problem is we're trying to And that's the walkthrough versus all the testimony we'll right. have. And I, okay. I, I just want to make it clear too, again, BLCT is, you know, invited with, in the same group, there's not a, you're against, so you have to wait two weeks or whatever. But it's not always the towns that stop the housing. It's the processes that may or may not exist, where someone in the community has the the appeal appeal That's process. The appeal. And the, that I don't yeah. mind. So having thought is, and we have appeals in here. Yes, yes. there's one. Yeah, there's one. Yes, yes. Well, there's, there's two. two, two there are two provisions yeah. for limiting appeals, but uh, I think there are lots of barriers. And, and this, we're just addressing a couple here, right. but there I are think, other I think, barriers. That but we this, know about. having sat on both the regional and the municipal planning commissions, this is a major power grab from the communities. It's re and the parking to me, and I'm the one that was always against the parking replacement fees. Um, but I also know that parking is the biggest issue in this city. And so to, to, yeah. to be exacerbating that, it's a, it's a major change. It's a, it's a big change. These are yes. big changes. I would just like to say, I did want to give us a break, but I would really before noon like to get Damien through his few sections so we can let both Damien and Ellen go back to the rest of their lives. <laughs> you know, start with Becky and David next week on different sections. The whole rest of the week is then devoted to having this conversation okay. with witnesses that, that you want to have. So um, if it's okay, if people just take a break five as the five, so five and eleven to get Damien. Yeah. And I'll, let's just see if we can get sure. Damien out of here in 45 minutes. He has some kind of miscellaneous rights to the right kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's got I think three or four sessions. Right. Thank you so much. Thank Ellen. you. This is a lot of <laughs> depth. It was much appreciated. And um, as as you know, um, well, you know, you may have seen that I asked David as the sort of umbrella drafter for this. We're clearly getting to a point where, toward the end of the week, both for our sake and people trying to follow along. We'd love to try and have a section by section that's very brief, um, where we can follow modifications we make to the bill as we go and what where those live. Um, so that will just hope to, you know, have have that from from you as part of a larger section by section. 
and then yes. we'll bring you back. In. <laughs> it doesn't have to I mean, be you know, our best. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that. yeah. And I'll write back to David, but very brief, just a way to keep track of literally new things. Right. Sort of like really that well. flow chart that in our. Yeah. So we're back. I mean, we'll be back at eleven. So we know what we're keeping, what we're cutting, what we're adding to. We are back live in Senate Economic Development, and we have Damian to go through the next three sections of draft 5.1 um, of our omnibus housing bill, starting with H20. Great. Thank you. For the record, Damian Leonard, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, would you like me to share this on the screen, or would you prefer to just we read have along it. in your own drafts? I think we all have it, right? Yeah, but, all, yeah. but for the public. Um, or they can look at it on. They can look. Oh, they can look. It's, off, it's posted. It's totally, okay. Okay. Yeah. It's great. Stylistic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Every committee has a different preference, so I always ask before I get started. Uh, so uh, we'll start in section 19, I believe. So we're just skipping we over the jurisdiction and coming back. Mm -hmm. to that. Right. So ADUs are Not outside of. We're into enforcement. Yes. Yes. So this is this is going to bring us into the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act, uh, which is how we enforce housing discrimination. It's worth noting before I go any deeper into this language that the language we're about to go over applies to both public accommodations and the fair housing. Uh, so that's something to note if you want to limit the application to just housing, we'd have to make a few tweaks to the language. Okay. Um, so uh, what we're doing here is amending in section 19, uh, 9 BSA 4506, which provides uh, basically the enforcement of the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act. Uh, we're adding new language here at the bottom of the page on line 19 that provides that a charge of discrimination uh, may be referred by the Human Rights Commission to the Attorney General or a state's attorney for either investigation and enforcement or following an investigation by the Commission for enforcement. So what this allows the Human Rights Commission to do is in certain instances where they think it's appropriate, they can either uh, ask the attorney general, uh, probably the attorney general, if we're talking investigation and enforcement, just because of the resources in that option, or following the Human Rights Commission's own investigation, if they don't have the resources to do the enforcement action, they could ask a state's attorney or the attorney general to do it for them. So it basically adds resources. Um, to the Human Rights Commission right now. Um, this is similar to some of the provisions we have around misclassification, where we allow, for example, the Department of Labor to refer instances of what it believes are systemic, potential systemic misclassification of employees to the Attorney General because of the, the greater resources there. The changes on page 23, um, are, are really just um, changes to align it with that new language allowing the attorney general or a state's attorney uh, to investigate uh, or enforce. Oh, and you're including state's attorneys here too? We are, and that's modeled on the employment laws around discrimination where under the Fair Employment Practices Act, both the state's attorneys and the attorney general have jurisdiction under the law as a practical matter. I think only the attorney general typically takes those cases because the state's attorneys have uh, limited resources and very full portfolio as well. Um, yeah. So it, with all of these, um, there's going to be a question of resources for all of these offices. So I imagine that will be a subject for committee testimony at some point. In section 20, at the bottom of page 23, uh, we've moved into uh, 
the next chapter of Title IX, which governs the Human Rights Commission. So we're amending 9 BSA 4554. Um, it, confusingly, this refers back to individuals who feel that they've been discriminated against under the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act. Uh, I apologize for that if it, it creates confusion. The law has been that way for decades at this point. So we'll just work with it as it is. The changes uh, on page 23 are just technical changes. Uh, as you have probably become very familiar with at this point, we're making the laws gender neutral. Um, and what's, sorry, what's interesting is that this one has a nice other benefit that they don't have to believe they were yes. subjects to unlawful discrimination. Yeah, well, so. That seems like a good thing that we're moving to. <laughs> well, so the, the old language, the, what it implies is that they believe, but they might not have been. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's inconsistent with our other anti-discrimination right. laws, which say an individual who's been subject to unlawful discrimination. Yeah. As a practical matter, there's going to be an investigation. Right. And you've right. got a burden of proof when you get to court or the mm -hmm. Human Rights Commission. So it takes the implication out of the law that perhaps these individuals are wrong and puts them on the same yeah. footing as all of our other anti-discrimination laws. They still have the same burden of proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I think that's great. Yeah. Um, on t page 24, uh, this, this gets into that burden of proof I was just mentioning. So if a complaint states a prima facie case, which basically means that you have to show uh, that you belong to a protected class, that you suffered uh, some sort of adverse or discriminatory treatment, or at least something that could be characterized that way, and that it can be traced to your protected class. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to prove all of that yet. It just means that on the face of the allegation, it appears that you have a case at first glance, and then the investigation and, and factual development goes from there. So um, what this basically provides in two is that the complaint can be accepted for investigation by the commission, or um, if the complaint alleges a violation of the provisions of the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act by a person other than the state, because the attorney general is also the defense attorney for the state, so that would create a conflict. Um, the commission may, in its discretion, refer the complaint to either the attorney general or a state's attorney for investigation and enforcement pursuant to subsection I of this section. Um, so that, that the other than the state piece is really just preventing some sort of uh, conflict of interest where you'd be asking the attorney general to investigate the party that it would then be charged with defending in court, which is uh, clearly problematic. Um, but so this would basically allow them to refer complaints against any private actor or a municipality or any other uh, political subdivision of the state that's not the state government itself. <clears throat> um, the, the next section here, we're doing corresponding changes, just to say if the commission does not refer the complaint to the AG or a state's attorney, it then lays out how the commission would carry out its investigation. Um, and this is all existing law here. So I will skip over it unless the committee wants to dig into the Human Rights Commission's process. Which brings us down to page 25, subsection E1 uh, is again existing law if the commission finds reasonable grounds to believe that discrimination occurred. Um, and then this next piece, E2, this gets to right now, um, the commission has six months to attempt to dispose of the case by informal means. So basically reach an informal resolution or settlement of the case. Uh, and then within that six months, if they are unable to reach an informal resolution, they also have to bring an action in superior court 
uh, or take further actions that we'll go into below. What this does is it extends, gives them 90 additional days after that six month period. So they can use the full six months to try for a formal resolution. Um, I saw a question from Senator Cummings. Well, it's not directly related to this, but I have a constituent who reached one of these agreements, housing discrimination resolution. Um, she didn't think she got what she bargained for, went back, asked to be released from the agreement, and the uh, Human Rights Commission said, no, you know, this is meets, it's, yeah, and was told there is no appeal from the Human Rights Commission decision. Now, you may not, I just can't believe we wrote something where there was no appeal to court. So that it's important to know what we're dealing with here is uh, that's a settlement, yes. which is at the end of the settlement, you agree to dismiss your case. Yes. Um, so it's a little bit different than if there is a decision by the commission and they they choose to take that to uh, court. So what the commission's options are at this point, if they can't reach a settlement. Well, this was a settlement. Right. And one of the parties to the settlement, the apartment wasn't as big as the blueprint said it was. So came back, said, I want out of the settlement. It's not what I thought it was. And the Human Rights Commission declined to let her out of the agreement. And she said there was no appeal to that decision for her. So I, okay. I think this you, is you getting... Can get back to... Yeah, I think this is... is getting a little bit outside yeah, of this is. and it gets into a kind of a completely different issue okay. of the law around enforcement of settlement agreements. Okay. Um, so probably better for us to have a conversation yes. offline. I thought maybe there might be some simple thing like, yes, there is an appeal. But okay. Oh, what a nice idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, if the case isn't disposed of by informal means, meaning by a settlement, then the Human Rights Commission would have 90 days following that six month period to either bring an action in Superior Court um, to enforce uh, the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act, to refer the case to the AG or a state's attorney to enforce uh, the provisions of the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act, and importantly, to potentially pursue a uh, fine, um, which we're going to talk about in a moment, um, or they could dismiss the proceedings. So uh, sometimes what you may have is a case where there isn't a clear violation that occurred, but maybe there was some um, bad behavior that occurred. And so the Human Rights Commission seeks to still find a settlement um, to get the parties to move forward and to address things, even if there isn't a clear or a strong case that unlawful conduct occurred. And, and I would defer to the commission for more discussion of how they make those decisions. Um, but oftentimes they can help, you know, uh, an alleged, an entity that allegedly discriminated, even if they don't have a clear showing that discrimination occurred, they can help them improve their practices if they can get them to enter into a settlement. And it can also help the individual who felt they were wrong to feel like they got some justice out of the situation. Um, but if you don't have a strong case, uh, it would be a waste of resources to bring the case in court uh, at that point so they could dismiss the proceedings. Um, subdivision three uh, is, is really rewriting existing language that allows the, all parties to consent to an extension of the time limits to complete good faith negotiations around the settlement. Um, 
and you'll see the the old language struck out just above it on lines four through six. Mm -hmm. Starting on line 11, new subsection I um, provides that the attorney general or a state's attorney can enforce the provisions of the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act by restraining prohibited acts, seeking civil penalties, obtaining assurances of discontinuance, and conduct conducting civil investigations in accordance with the Consumer Protection Act as though unlawful discrimination in violation of the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act were an unfair act in commerce. This mirrors the language we have in the Fair Employment Practices Act that gives the attorney general and state's attorneys jurisdiction there. The, um, the language that goes on here providing the same rights and remedies for someone who's uh, accused of wrongdoing um, and then allowing the superior courts to impose the same civil penalties and investigation costs and to order other relief to the state and individuals who are harmed by discrimination um, also tracks with the Fair Employment Practices Act. So what we've done is take what we already have for employment discrimination and bring it into fair housing and public accommodations uh, to the extent that the state's attorneys or the attorney general uh, gets involved in the enforcement here. So currently the AG doesn't have this enforcement, right? So what we're, we're really adding enforcement to help the resources of the Human Rights Commission, which is under-resourced. Sadly, attorney generals and state's attorneys are under-resourced also. So, right, so which is one of the challenges. Do we have an appropriation with this? Uh, I don't believe there's okay. one in the bill currently, um, but I, I think if the committee decides to move forward with this language or to consider moving forward, probably your next conversation mm -hmm. is with our new attorney general to and, and the ask the Office her, of State's Attorneys and the Office and of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs so, um, yeah. to ask them if they have the resources and if they see potential issues with this expansion. Um, and likewise, the Human Rights Commission uh, yeah. to see if yeah. they have concerns about this uh, potential um, ability to refer and, and the sharing authority. And not that this so. is satisfactory, but we do have legally come in this week who could at least speak to when they, I mean, they have a fair housing program that they can at least speak to when they feel like this has abruptly ended or been delayed because there's no place. Oh, the, I'm sure that the need can be articulated and, and illustrated. Uh, it's uh, when we, I mean, you know, we just all have yeah. to be careful when we add take uh, when we add resources to one group mm -hmm. and add more responsibilities to another, we have to enable the other group to be able to actually do right. the work. And I want to make sure I, I understand who, like where this all came from, you know. So this was- Who's going to be defending this fully? <laughs> the, this is language that was requested by the working group. Okay. Um, I oh, don't right. know specifically um, who proposed it, okay. but- um, it came out of those discussions uh, okay. in the fall. So Representative Bongarts could. Yeah, he could point you towards. To, the, yeah. And we, yeah. we we do we have asked Susan Davis to come in as well, who has been part of the discussion. So. Yeah. So I I would defer to them on mm -hmm. on the need that they saw. Mm -hmm. um, so um, one additional change in here from the Fair Employment Practices Act, though, on the top of page 27, lines one and two, is the cross-reference to the criminal penalty for violations of the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act, uh, which we'll get to next. Um, so the next section, section 21, amends that section, 9 BSA 4507, to increase the criminal penalty from $1,000 uh, to $10,000 per violation. So there are two important things there. One, the penalty is going up by $9,000. Two, it's changing from a criminal penalty or fine of not more than $1,000 period 
to $10,000 per violation. Uh, so this could become a significant penalty for someone who engages in widespread discrimination. Of course, it's not more, so the court has discretion to right. tailor that penalty um, as it sees fit, if it even decides to impose it. So, and that is it. Or oh no, I away. Safety. Away from building safety. I tried, I don't know tried to okay. tried to get out of that. <laughs> no. Um sorry, I forgot. Um that's it for fair housing and public accommodations. Are there questions about those sections? No, I just think we have mm -hmm. identified the people we need to hear from. Yeah, there's clearly some some significant policy questions. Um so uh section 22 is a report from the division of fire safety uh it would require a report on or before next january 15th from the executive director of the division of fire safety um and going on to page 28 uh it would identify and examine provisions from other jurisdictions fire and life safety codes for residential buildings uh, that would facilitate in Vermont the increased construction of new residential units, the conversion of existing space into new residential units, or both. Uh, and importantly, could be incorporated into the Vermont Fire and Building Safety Code. So what this is trying to get at is whether there are uh, code provisions in other jurisdictions uh, that could make it easier to uh, construct or convert residential units. So convert existing building stock into residential units or construct new residential units. Uh, that could it be incorporated into the Vermont Fire and Building Safety Code. Um, it would give the uh, executive director of the Division of Fire Safety the ability to uh, pick and choose provisions they think would protect fire and life safety. Um, but also potentially allow for uh, improved ease in the conversion or construction of new units. Um, it would include recommendations for legislative action necessary to enable any of the identified provisions to be incorporated into Vermont's Fire and Building Safety Code. Um, and right now, the wording is fairly broad around the the Division of Fire Safety's authority. Um, but uh, as far as adopting the code goes, and if you look at our fire and building safety codes, um, the rules adopted around them uh, include a number of amendments to the national code to make it fit Vermont's needs. And so this is asking whether there are other amendments that could be made. Um, so, uh, but you'll probably want to hear from the Division of Fire Safety and and um, and other advocates around housing on on considerations with this potential study and whether the language needs to be tweaked. Any questions? Just a quick question. So, can other jurisdictions be smaller, like towns? Could it be other states? Yeah, it, it, it could be. It could be other states, other countries. It could be Canadian provinces. It could be cities. And um, it could be towns within Vermont, if they have. So, any. towns within Vermont um, are required to have the Vermont Code as sort of their base. Um, so there wouldn't be anything applicable. So most likely you're not going to find much in municipalities and towns in Vermont that they would be able to apply statewide, but there's a chance. Maybe there's something that's been approved. Um, so I don't know the details of the code. Um, so that, that would be potentially a better question for the executive director of the division. Um, but certainly this would allow the executive director to say, and this is a, absolutely a hypothetical that say Quebec has a really, um, uh, you know, a, a new approach to addressing uh, means of egress, which they've seen bring down the cost of new construction and it's potentially as safe or safer than our required egress. Maybe we could incorporate that here and they could start doing that consideration of whether that sort of thing makes sense 
for Vermont, given the differences between us and Quebec and uh, and so forth. So there there are a lot of considerations that will come into saying whether a code provision in another jurisdiction would work in Vermont because of the differences in our building stock, our firefighting capabilities, um, and even even just in the basic construction style and the technologies that we use. Um, but I'm not an expert on those things by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so I would definitely defer to the fire and building safety experts and uh, the folks who are doing housing construction. And we'll have we'll have them in. Senator Clarkson, and then we're gonna get Becky in. Because the other piece we need an update on is how the, the transition from the town health officers to the fire and safety inspection statewide how that's going we need an update on that and see how that's rolling out and uh because that's one of the other things we did uh is that we um, added the ability for towns to access uh fire ins and safety health inspectors statewide great because there are six towns you know that have their own inspection right well, maybe even like a all of town now. health officers many of whom are not wanting to do the work they're now required to do so great. Thank, thank you so that. much, David. Thank, thank you for your time. So yeah, um, and yeah, that was speedy. So I, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I would say for the next section with Becky, um, uh, in the witness chair, or, um, we have. I, I would. I made an executive decision. I will say to take anything TIF related and put it in here because I didn't think we would have time to set finance a separate TIF bill, but now we have three people on finance in this committee. So I wanted to spend the next 15 minutes just talking about very high level, what TIF sections are, are in this bill and then having an open discussion on whether or not how we, how we flow TIFs that may not be in this bill, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, I think everyone is familiar with TIFs, but I didn't know if you wanted me to go over very broadly. Like, I'm broad okay. Are you? So uh, generally, <laughs> they're different in Vermont, but um, I mean, I'm familiar with the Winooski one. But, yeah. Um, well, I think but that, they're different from each other. Right. But the new ones that we're going into these project-based yeah. TIFs, which yeah. is small. Yeah. Like, right. It would. Okay. Yeah. 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 Let's um, do what you want to do. Okay. If I have questions, so, I'll ask them later. Okay. Because <laughs> Winooski is different. Winooski, Burlington, and Georgia all, and then finance did a statewide right. standard. So other than those, okay. I think there's five. Yeah. Okay. They're, okay. All just, they're all the same. Um, okay. Yeah. So just very generally speaking, it is an economic development tool that helps uh, where a municipality can borrow funds for public infrastructure. And then um, the idea is that will bring in private investment and increase property tax revenues. Mm -hmm. um, and I will just also preface by saying it became a bigger issue today, given what the headlines look like for Burlington. So that okay. is another reason. My paper was in the driveway oh, yeah. and it won't have the headlines for three days yeah well i don't <laughs> i don't want to take us down a rabbit okay. hole but the auditor had dinged oh. burlington for a number of mistakes that are expensive yes um and burlington is not denying at least some of them so we may have to look at tips as a bigger issue than just oh these are a couple issues we've dealt with in the past we tried to get a change to the inspection schedule and the auditor and the treasurer from Burlington couldn't work it out. Yeah. It was quite frustrating. Right. So we may not have time for that. Yes. Not here. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you, so um so the there is the existing TIP district program that I think everyone is familiar with where there are the, the districts um, in certain municipalities. But what is in this bill is setting up um, what has been called the mini tips, the project based tips. And so, um, and I wanted to give this overview because a lot of the language is essentially using the, 
the framework for TIF districts to set up how the project-based TIF school work, but they're sort of on a they're they're on a smaller scale. And so this um, project-based TIF language, I think, started three or four years ago, um, and has um, never never passed and. The version in this bill is slightly different than I think what everyone has seen before. So I can I can walk through the language. I can sort of note where it is different from where it was before. Yeah. Oh, it's, I, I just, yeah. I and wanna... and just in the highest level overview, I I want to make sure I remember. So far, does this is this project based TIFs and there's the two TIF extensions requested yeah. from Barry City and Hartford. Hartford, Hartford. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and that completes the TIF section. Yeah, so there are only so, three. So there's the right. project-based TIFs, and then there are the extensions for two of the uh, active TIF districts. OK, great. Um, so I can run through um, the project-based TIF language. Um, uh, sorry, I'll go back to the very tip. I, I think I just received today what the extension was for that. So right now the language in the bill is a placeholder. Um, so I can fill that out in the next draft. And, and those are all being introduced to separate bills too. Um, okay. okay, that's how they use. <laughs> oh yeah, you can't. She came from Virginia, I love it. No. Wait, okay. okay. That, I'm that just saying as a sponsor of yeah. one of them, uh, they're being introduced to separate bills. Right. You know that both are. I know that art. Okay, is. well, that's see, that's I would know. assume one of the very reps probably get yeah. introducing. So it's being introduced in the House and the Senate. So okay. I don't have to start a TIF extension. Nobody's talked to me, but they come to me. It could that could be my fault because yeah. I went to the LCT and said, Could you tell me who is requesting a TIF extension? So. Yeah, it's. I've not known DLCG to be involved in the process before. Mm. I am saying to you, a Hartford TIF extension is coming to you also. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, the project based TIF language starts on page 28 of the bill. Um, and the subsection A uh, has all the definitions that apply to the project-based tips. Um, and I will first note um, just the title of the section that is different is that in previous years when this was introduced, it was a pilot program, but this is not being introduced as a pilot program. Um, and then, uh, and I can go into greater detail if you want, but um, I can, I'm going to note where some of the definitions, there, there are changes. Um, so the definition of financing for TIF districts is um, basically saying uh, the debt that a municipality incurs that they can use to pay for the improvements in the, um, for the project. Um, and in previous years, uh, there was language included on the use of bond anticipation notes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was taken out in this version. Um, and that was included with respect to um, uh, when the debt would be counted as being incurred for the purpose of um, the, the project being uh, created and the ability to retain increment, but the clock starts running. So, fund and anticipation notes can still be used. It's just they're not in this. Um, and my my understanding is yes. There was specific language in previous years on trying to clarify when. The use of bond anticipation notes um, counted towards the like the first incurrence of debt. Okay. And when I think because this is a, yeah. Okay. So this is okay. a, these projects are shorter time periods um, for uh, like the debt incurrence um, than 
a district. So I think maybe it, I think maybe that was left out because of the way these are structured, but this language came from the um, ACCD, so they could probably um, speak to why they took it so, out. Okay, shorter time periods, less money. Smaller projects designed for smaller towns to be able to access. Yes. Right. There's the tension. Yeah, only and, for 20 years. And, or actually now oh, it's- And there is, I will not allow the discussion in my committee because it is a religiously held conviction <laughs> that you do not overturn with logic or data, whether or not those projects would have been built whether or not we oh, did a chip oh. would the hampton inn have gone in and paid money into the ed fund somewhere in the state rather than in downtown burlington where the uh, not burlington st albans where the money doesn't get paid into the ed fund for 20 years or all of it does. Yeah. I no no like you don't talk about that anymore. No. Okay. You, there's <laughs> no logic. There are a couple things in this building, like whether or not rich people will move in or out of the state, no matter how much you tax them, that data doesn't matter. You either believe it mm -hmm. or you don't. Some of us okay. love tips. I see. Some of us hate tips. Okay. Some of us love tips, but vote against many tips. I am the queen okay. of tips. <laughs> good to know. Yeah, it's good. We want to have it's something in a discussion about whether or not this, this will well, be a discussion I, 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 we should know. Yeah. I'm thinking we may be moving out of the need for big tips because they really are only suited to larger municipalities that really do have a finance, a planning, a zoning department. And maybe if we did away with big tips and focused into the more smaller, and then is that the best way to finance those small projects? Mm -hmm. But that I think might That's be a good, a good discussion. Mm -hmm. But. But small towns came to us and said, can we do? Oh, yeah, yeah I'm aware of that. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, they're they're a pretty good source of yeah. funding. Yeah. Uh, okay. So moving on to page 29, um, the definition of improvements. Uh, so this is the sort of infrastructure that um, the municipality is doing with uh, by incurring debt to, to pay for that infrastructure. Um, in the previous version, there was language about the use of debt service payments, um, limiting it to five years that you could fund debt service uh, payments. And that was removed um, and included here is in the definition of improvements. It says that this also means the funding of debt service interest payments. So it's sort of making a, a policy decision that the legislature has been wrestling with the last few years about um, whether those are um, included in what can be paid for um, out of the what, what can it be. The debt can be incurred to pay for debt service payments. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there, uh, in the previous version, was a definition of a nexus requirement. The definition was removed, but later on um, in the language, there's um, a determination that Betsy has to make to say that there's a ne nexus between the improvement and the expected development and outcomes. Um, so that's sort of still in here, just not um, in the definition section. Um, the definition of project on page, beginning on page 30, um, this is what can be, you know, what do we mean by a, a TIP project? Um, there have been, 
various versions. I think the last uh, time this came out of Senate Finance, there was a monetary cap on the amount of the project. Um, <clears throat> so that was removed. So there's no there's no cap on this, you know the size of the project in terms of um, a threshold. And then um, some of the criteria was uh, changed. So this has that a project must meet one of the following four criteria. And uh, these line up um, mostly with what the tip district criteria are. So on page 31 under um, subsection B, again, there was language removed to this being um, a pilot program. Um, previous versions had a limit on the amount of projects that could be approved during the term of the pilot program. Um, this has no limit to the number of projects, but does say um, there's not more than one for municipality. Did we post that out last year and it died in ropes? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, it, I think it did die in the because there yeah. was also S33, which was the tip district bill that didn't get out of finance. But okay. I think the Mini tip bill made it, and the, the limit case there is some concern that small towns who have three to five select board members who may or may not know anything about finance or development, a clerk treasurer who may or may not know anything, and no town manager, no. Uh, that you could easily get yourself in over your head, mm -hmm. especially if you've got a developer selling you a bill of goods. And that's other than the impact on the Ed Fund, um, one of the concerns that surfaced in finance. Thank you. So we have hit noon, and I think it was. I think it was valuable to start talking about there are some changes that if we discuss project based tips again would be you know nuanced changes to this bill. I don't think it's discussions we haven't seen before. Um, we don't have Senator Brock here today, he's not feeling well, but I think there is a bigger question and I'm looking at Senator Cummings about um, if you want to see project-based tips come from this committee or see it in a separate bill that goes directly to your committee with other tip requests. I don't or you want our informal input. Yeah, I, I don't care how it comes okay. to us. The question is, do you want the rest of your bill coming <laughs> to us? Um, because I've got enough new members. I, yeah. Don't right. know how it's going to shift out. Um, I, I think that the extensions need to come to mm -hmm. us as separate bills. Mm -hmm. I, those were the last resort. And yeah, it's, I believe it has. It should be a formal application, not right buried in a an economic development bill. Right. Um, so, do does. Does anyone currently here have strong feelings about uh, project based tips in general or us giving informal input versus sending a bill over? So maybe we introduce a separate bill on this topic and we're, we'll definitely. So that we don't it. send the whole housing. Are yeah. there other areas? Because the other pieces would go to approach, mm -hmm. but not necessarily to finance. Right. No, yeah. planning and zoning changes. You don't uh, have to take it. They may go to GovOps. <laughs> I mean, I think we're giving other committees uh, yeah. passing. Just, you know, we will, this will, you know, and, and uh, Natural Resources, they will probably have a day long, you know, kind of discussion 
Oh, at least. Yes. <laughs> well, we would come in, you know, and yeah. you know, give them a chance to, to think about it. But um, unless someone has strong feelings, we'll, we'll certainly strike the extensions. And for now, uh, we could do we, it separately. We'll request a separate project-based tip bill. If anybody would like to be on it, I don't know, Senator. I'd love to be on it. Expressing interest in moving in that direction. <laughs> You know, but you don't have to be. I happen to be a fan, and I think we're going to hear ACTV so right. ideas on how to simplify some. Of yes, and VLCT will be coming in and talk about how important this is to them. We so that I wanted to have that discussion while we were online, so that this didn't just disappear without conversation. But I think we're done in committee, mm -hmm. and um, that's the path that we'll take on okay. tips. Great. Thank you, Becky. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.